And still, after all this time, the sun has never said to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with love like that. It lights up the sky. Rumi. Introduction. You can start out with nothing, and out of nothing, and out of no way, a way will be made. Reverend Michael Bernard Beckwith, former drug enthusiast, turned spiritual enthusiast, turned inspirational badass. I used to think quotes like this were a bunch of crap. I also didn't understand what the hell they were talking about. I mean, not that I cared. I was too cool. What little I knew about the spiritual slash self-help world, I found to be unforgivably cheesy. It reeked of desperation, rah-rah churchiness, and unwanted hugs from unappealing strangers. And don't even get me started on how grouchy I used to be about God. At the same time, there was all this stuff about my life that I desperately wanted to change, and had I been able to bulldoze through my holier-than-thouism, I could have really used some help around here. I mean, overall, I was doing pretty well. I'd published a couple of books, had a lot of great friends, a close family, an apartment, a car that ran, food, teeth, clothes, clean drinking water. Compared to the majority of the planet, my life was a total cream puff. But compared to what I knew I was capable of, I was, shall we say, unimpressed. I always felt like, come on, this is the best I can do? Really? I'm going to make just enough to pay my rent this month? Again? And I'm going to spend another year dating a bunch of weirdos so I can be in all these wobbly, non-committal relationships and create even more drama? Really? And am I seriously going to question what my deeper purpose is and wallow in the misery of that quagmire for the millionth time? It was a snore. I felt like I was going through the motions of living my lukewarm life with the occasional flare-ups of awesomeness here and there. And the most painful part was that deep down I knew I was a total rock star. That I had the power to give and receive and love with the best of them. That I could leap tall buildings in a single bound and could create anything I put my mind to and... What's that? I just got a parking ticket? You have got to be kidding me. Let me see that. I can't afford to pay this. It's like my third one this month. I'm going down there to talk to them right now. Then, doop-dee-doo, off I'd go, consumed once again by low-level minutia, only to find myself, a few weeks later, wondering where those few weeks went and how it could possibly be that I was still stuck in my rickety-ass apartment eating dollar tacos by myself every night. I'm assuming, if you're listening to this, that there are some areas of your life that aren't looking so good either, and that you know could be looking a whole lot better. Maybe you're living with your soulmate and are joyfully sharing your gifts with the world, but are so broke that your dog is on his own if he wants to get fed. Maybe you're doing great financially and you have a deep connection to your higher purpose, but you can't remember the last time you wet your pants laughing. Or maybe you suck equally at all of those and spend your free time crying or drinking or getting pissed off at all the meter maids who have precision timing and no sense of humor who, in your mind, are partly responsible for your personal financial crisis. Or maybe you have everything you've ever wanted, but for some reason you still feel unfulfilled. This isn't necessarily about making millions of dollars, or helping solve the world's problems, or getting your own TV show, unless that's your thing. Your calling could simply be to take care of your family, or to grow the perfect tulip. This is about getting mighty clear about what makes you happy, and what makes you feel the most alive and then creating it instead of pretending you can't have it, or that you don't deserve it, or that you're a greedy, egomaniacal fathead for wanting more than you already have, or listening to what Dad and Aunt Mary think you should be doing. It's about having the cojones to show up as the brightest, happiest, badassiest version of yourself, whatever that looks like to you. The good news is that in order to do this, all you need to do is make one simple shift. You need to go from wanting to change your life to deciding to change your life. Wanting can be done sitting on the couch with a bong in your hand and a travel magazine in your lap. Deciding means jumping in all the way, doing whatever it takes, and going after your dreams with the tenacity of a dateless cheerleader a week before prom night. You'll probably have to do things you never imagined you'd do because if any of your friends saw you doing it or spending money on it, you'd never live it down. 
or they'd be concerned about you. Or they'd stop being friends with you because now you're all weird and different. You'll have to believe in things you can't see, as well as some things that you have full-on proof are impossible. You're going to have to push past your fears, fail over and over again, and make a habit out of doing things you're not so comfy doing. You're going to have to let go of old, limiting beliefs and cling to your decision to create the life you desire like your life depends on it. Because guess what? Your life does depend on it. As challenging as this may sound, it's nowhere near as brutal as waking up in the middle of the night feeling like someone parked a car on your chest, crushed under the realization that your life is zooming by and you have yet to start living it in a way that has any real meaning to you. You may have heard stories about people who had these major breakthroughs when the shit really hit the fan. They found a lump or got their electricity turned off or were moments away from having sex with strangers to buy drugs when suddenly they woke up, transformed. But you don't have to wait until you hit rock bottom to start crawling out of your hole. All you have to do is make the decision. And you can make it right now. There's a great line from the poet Anais Nin that reads, And the day came when the risk to remain tight in a bud was more painful than the risk it took to blossom. This is how it was for me, and how I think it is for most people. My journey was a process, and still is, that started with my decision to make some serious changes, regardless of what I had to do to make them. None of the things I'd already tried were working. Mulling it over and over with my equally broke friends and my therapist, working my ass off, going out for a beer and hoping it would take care of itself. I was at the point where I would try anything to get my act together. And lordy, lord, 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 it's like the universe was testing me to see just how serious I was. I went to motivational seminars where they made me wear a name tag and high five the person next to me while shouting, you're awesome and so am I. I beat a pillow with a baseball bat and shrieked like I was on fire. I bonded with my spirit guide, participated in a group ceremony where I married myself, wrote a love letter to my uterus, read every self-help book under the sun, and spent blood-curdling amounts of money I did not have hiring private coaches. Basically, I took one for the team. If you're new to the self-help world, I'm hoping this book will ease you into some of the basic concepts that totally changed my life so you can have a breakthrough too, without making you want to run off screaming in the process. Your higher self is proactive. I'm in control of my life. I think I'll head on out and kick me some ass. It's also love-based, and it's committed to creating a reality based on your limitless potential. As soon as you wake up from the big snooze. Your true self lives in the present, not stuck in your head, totally believes in miracles, and is one with the universe. We all experience life in varying degrees from both perspectives. And while I seriously doubt there's anyone who's totally snooze-free, most people are so wrapped up in the BS that they're settling for realities that are way beneath what's available to them. Very few people are even aware of what's available, however, because we live in a fear-based society that loves to get all uppity towards people who wake up from the big snooze, blast out of their comfort zones, and follow their hearts into the great unknown. Oftentimes, taking great leaps of faith is labeled as irresponsible or selfish or insane. Until you succeed, of course, and then you're brilliant. This is because watching someone else totally go for it can be incredibly upsetting to the person who spent a lifetime building a solid case for why they themselves can't. I'm obviously generalizing and there are plenty of people out there cheering us on, but one of the first things you might have to deal with when you decide to wake up from the big snooze and make massive positive changes in your life is disapproval from other people who are snoring away, especially the people closest to you lame as this may sound. They may express their discomfort in all sorts of ways. Anger, hurt, bafflement, criticism, snorting every time you talk about your new business or your new friends, constant remarks about how you're not the way you used to be, worrying, teasing, blocking you from all social media outlets, etc. Surely, are you really going to quit your secure corporate job to open a nail salon? When you've got two children, a mortgage, and high blood pressure, so few new businesses succeed, especially in this economy. Aren't you worried about what will happen to your family if you fail? Of course, Shirley is worried about what will happen to her family if she fails. She wakes up every night seized by panic about it, 
but she's moving past her fear to create something she's really psyched about. Rather than dying a slow, painful death hanging around the water cooler with you, whining about how dry the cake was at the birthday party your boss threw for you in the conference room last week. Even though they're often doing it out of love and concern, having others smear their fear and worry all over you is the last thing you need when you're strengthening your superhero muscles to step out and take some risks. So I highly recommend keeping your mouth shut around people who are going to bring you down. Instead, seek out those who are already totally kicking butt, or who are lifting up their foot to do so, or people who you know will be supportive and confide in them. Because you'll have your own internal freak show to deal with as you try to overcome the objections from your own BS. The big snooze is like an overprotective Italian mother, who not only doesn't want you to ever go outside, but who wants you to live with her forever. Her intentions are good, but fully fear-based. As long as you stay inside the familiar, risk-free zone of your present reality, the big snooze is content. But should you try and sneak past her to attend the rockin' party outside, your overprotective controlling mother is going to claw, scratch, scream, bite, hurl her body in front of your rapidly approaching new life. Basically, she's going to do whatever she can to stop you. And it ain't going to be pretty. It's like when you quit smoking or doing drugs and go into withdrawal. Finally, you've taken a leap and done something that's going to massively improve your life. And for days, sometimes weeks, you feel worse than you did when you were a wild child. You're hacking up all this nasty crap, ridding your body of toxins, shaking, sweating, puking, wondering why on earth you thought this was a good idea. It's really fun. Same goes for when we rid ourselves of limiting subconscious beliefs that have been holding us back and take a giant leap outside our comfort zone. It's a detox of such staggering proportions that sometimes it can feel like the universe is conspiring against us. Trees fall on our cars, our computers crash, we find our significant others in bed with our best friends, we get our identities stolen, we get the flu, our roofs cave in, we sit in gum. When in reality, the big snooze is creating chaos in an attempt to self-sabotage and keep everything as is, instead of moving forward into unknown yet desperately wanted new territory. Every successful person knows this and has been through this. When taking great leaps forward, life often turns to shit before it turns to Shinola. I realize this might seem a bit far-fetched, but remember, you create your reality, and you've spent a lifetime creating the reality you presently exist in based largely on your limiting false beliefs. When you decide to rewire these beliefs, go for what's truly in your heart and do a massive overhaul on yourself and your world, you're basically murdering the big snooze. And she is going to come at you, rolling pin raised high over her head, to beat you back into your old life. We are very powerful creatures who create our realities through focused energy, and should our subconscious mind decide to focus that energy at stopping ourselves from taking a risk because it's freaking out and terrified, things can get a little crazy around here. The big snooze will do everything it can to stop you from changing and growing, especially since you're attempting to obliterate the very identity that you and everyone else has come to know as you. Never underestimate the power of the big snooze scorned. Sometimes the big snooze sets up emotional blocks to try and stop us. Other times she gets physical. I have a client who decided to quit his ho-hum yet high-paying job to start his dream company from scratch. He had no idea where to start, what he wanted to do, or how he was going to pull it off. And regardless of the fact that he had a family that was counting on him, no guarantees, and even fewer leads, he quit his secure job and went for it because he was determined to create a life he loved. That's when the BS hit the fan. He got not one, but two flat tires after leaving a coaching session with me. His babysitter ran into his wife's car while driving his car. The water main under his kitchen exploded, and right before his first big deal went through, he got hit by a freaking bus. I'm pleased to report he's fine now. But even with all those extremely convincing excuses to say, okay, fine, screw it, you win, he never gave up. This is sort of the same way the God thing happened for me. It started out with much snarkiness and eye rolling, but I was so broke and clueless and sick of being such a weenie about really going for it in my life that I was open for suggestions. Which is why when I started reading books on finding your calling and making money and getting over yourself already, and they all had the spiritual side to them, I didn't toss them in the goodwill pile with my usual, this God spirituality crap is for suckers attitude. Instead, I decided to give good old God a chance because I had nothing to lose, literally. 
and lo and behold, some of it wasn't totally idiotic. So I started reading more about it. Then I started studying it. Then I started putting it into practice. Then I noticed how much better it made me feel. Then I started believing it. Then I noticed all these awesome shifts starting to happen in my life. Then I became obsessed with it. Then I started loving it. Then I started radically changing my life with it. Then I started teaching it. Now I'm basically riding the mechanical bull about it. Punching my fist in the air and yelling to the guy manning the controls. Hit it, Wayne! Wherever you happen to stand on the God issue, let me just say that this whole improving your life thing is going to be a hell of a lot easier if you have an open mind about it. Call it whatever you want. God, goddess, the big guy, the universe, source energy, the grand poobah, gut, intuition, the force, the zone, the vortex, the mother load. It doesn't matter. Personally, I find the God word to be a tad too loaded. I prefer source energy, the universe, the vortex, spirit, the mother load, all of which I will be using interchangeably throughout this book, by the way. Whatever you choose to call it isn't important. What is important is that you start to develop an awareness of and a relationship with the source energy that's surrounding you and within you, which is all the same energy and which will be your best pal ever if you give it a chance. Because here's the thing. All of us are connected to this limitless power and most of us aren't using but a fraction of it. Our energy is taking a joy ride in these bodies of ours, learning, growing and evolving along the way. One would hope anyway. I suppose numbing, shrinking, and moving back in with our parents is also an option. Until our corporal journey comes to an end and we move on. Thanks for the lift! This realization that we're made up of and connected to source energy made me want to have a deeper understanding of spirituality so I could make my physical experience as awesome as possible. And let me tell you, ever since I got into it, it has been awesomeness maximus. When I'm connected with source energy and in the flow, I am so much more powerful, so much more in tune to my physical world and the world beyond, and just so much happier in general. And the more I meditate and the more attention I give to this relationship with my invisible superpower, the more effortlessly I can manifest the things and experiences I want into my life and do it with such specificity and at such a rapid rate that it makes my hair stand up. It's like I finally figured out how to make my magic wand work. If loving spirit is wrong, I don't want to be right. Here is the foundation for all the work we're about to do together on your life. The universe is made up of source energy. All energy vibrates at a certain frequency, which means you're vibrating at a certain frequency and everything you desire and don't desire is also vibrating at a certain frequency. Vibration attracts like vibration. Otherwise known as the law of attraction, the basic idea is focus on that which makes you feel good and ye shall attract that which makes you feel good. We're all attracting energy to ourselves all the time whether we realize it or not. And when we're vibrating at a low frequency, such as feeling pessimistic, needy, victimized, jealous, shameful, worried, convinced we're ugly, etc., yet expect high frequency awesome things and experiences to come into our lives, we are often disappointed. You need to raise your frequency to match the vibration of the one you want to tune into. It's like trying to listen to a certain radio station but tuning in at the wrong frequency. If you have a hot and sexy date and want to listen to 105.9 FM slow jams, but set your dial to 89.9 FM national public radio, you're not only going to be slow jamless, but you're more likely to attract a discussion about immigration laws in the U.S. instead of attracting a relaxed and candlelit body that's in the mood for love. The universe will match whatever vibration you put out, and you can't fool the universe. Which is why, when you're vibrating at a high frequency, awesome things seem to flow to you effortlessly, and you seem to stumble over the perfect people and opportunities all the time, and vice versa. As Albert Einstein observed, coincidence is God's way of remaining anonymous. When you learn to consciously master the energetic realm, believe in the not yet seen and stay in your highest frequency, you harness your innate power to create the reality you desire. So once again, good old awareness is your key to freedom. Once you realize that you can dramatically improve your situation by connecting with source energy and raising your frequency, you can freaking do it already. I'll tell you exactly how later. 
instead of opting to stay in the suck hole and feeling like a victim of pathetic circumstances, such as microwaving ramen in its styrofoam cup for dinner, or working for someone who makes your flesh crawl. In order to truly raise your vibration, you've got to believe that everything you want is available to you. And the best way to keep this belief strong is by staying connected to source energy. It's like we're surrounded by this big, all-you-can-eat buffet of incredible experiences and insights and feelings and opportunities and things and people and ways to share our gifts with the world. And all we have to do is align our energy with what we want and take decisive action to allow this good into our lives. And this decisive action part is key. Sadly, we can't just float around our neighbor's pool on a raft with cup holders sipping cocktails and being all high frequency while waiting for unicorns to fly down from the sky. We have to take action. Hell bent for glory kind of action. The trick is to have both parts, energy and action, working in unison. Unless your energy is lined up properly with that which you desire, really desire, any action you take is going to require way more effort to get you where you want to go, if it gets you there at all. Once in a while you may get lucky doing one without the other, but if you get very clear on what you truly want, rather than what you think you should want, believe that it's available to you regardless of your present circumstances, and remember the best way to do this is by staying connected to source energy and keeping your frequency high, and then take decisive action, you will eventually succeed. Have you ever had a dream where you're flying and you're having such a blast, but then you realize, hey, wait a minute, I'm flying, I can't fly. And then you come crashing back down to the ground and you can't get yourself back up again? No matter what you try, this is the way beliefs work. Even if it seems impossible, you have to have faith anyway. And the second you stop believing, you pop the bubble and stop attracting the magic into your life. The force really is with you. This isn't just about believing and being all high vibe when the sun is out and the bunnies are hopping around either. This is about believing, even when things are at their most uncertain or absolute crappiest, that there is a bright, shiny flip side within your reach. As French author and fearless truth seeker André Guide so aptly put it, one does not discover new lands without consenting to lose sight of the shore for a very long time. This is about believing that we live in a loving, kind, and abundant universe instead of one that's petty, mean, and likes other people more than it likes you. This is about your faith being greater than your fear. Chapter 3. Present as a Pigeon If you're depressed, you are living in the past. If you're anxious, you're living in the future. If you are at peace, you are living in the present. Lao Tzu, ancient Chinese philosopher, founder of Taoism, could have been one guy or a mythical compilation of many, nobody really knows for sure. I was in yoga class one day, and the instructor told us all to get into pigeon pose, which is this pose where you stretch one leg out behind you, fold the other one out sideways in front of you, and then bend forward and lie down on top of the whole thing. It's fine if you're a pigeon, but it's one of the poses I dread most because my hips don't move that way, it hurts, and I'm always scared I'm going to get stuck. But even though my body has requested otherwise, I'm in class and I'm going for it and I'm determined to relax into it even though I'm really just silently begging the dude to tell us to change into a different pose, which he doesn't do because he's too busy talking. He's blabbing on and on and on about our connection to the universe and our breath and the path to true enlightenment and holy fucking shit, dude, will you hurry up? I think I'm gonna rip something, I really do. Oh my God, I think I'm actually stuck. How am I going to get out of this pose? He's going to have to come over here and lift me out of it because I really, truly am stuck and then whoosh. If you've already dipped your toe in the self-help pond, I hope it'll say something in a new way that turns a light on so you can make some major shifts, create some tangible results, and someday wake up crying tears of giddy disbelief that you get to be you. And if I can save one person from ever having to take their inner child on a play date, I have done my job. My main focus when I started working on myself was how to make money. I had no idea how to make it on a consistent basis and was totally weirded out by admitting that I even wanted to in the first place. I was a writer and a musician. I felt it was sufficient and quite noble, thank you very much, to focus on my art and let the money part work itself out. That went real well. But I saw so many people doing such sleazy and heartbreaking things to make money not to mention those people who were working jobs that were death of a thousand wounds boring, that I wanted no part of it. 
Add to that my slew of other crippling beliefs about the unholy dollar, and it's a wonder I wasn't eating out of a dumpster. I finally realized that I needed not only to focus on making money, but that I also needed to get over my fear and loathing of it if I wanted to start pulling it in. This is when the self-help books started infiltrating my house, and the name tags assumed their mandatory and humiliating post above my left boob. Eventually, I took my credit card debts to unthinkable heights by forking over more money than I'd paid for all my janky cars put together and hired my first coach. Within the first six months, I tripled my income with an online business that I created around coaching writers. And now I've grown it to a place where it affords me the means and the luxury to travel the world freely while I write, speak, play music, and coach people in all areas of their lives using many of the concepts I used to so enjoy rolling my eyes at and with which I am now obsessed. In an attempt to get you where you want to go too, I'm going to ask you to roll with some pretty out there things throughout this book, and I want to encourage you to have an open mind. No, on second thought, I want to yell in your face about it. Stay open or else you are screwed. I mean it, this is really important. You've gotten to where you are right now by doing whatever it is you're doing. So if you're less than impressed with your current situation, you clearly need to change things up. If you want to live a life you've never lived, you have to do things you've never done. I don't care how big a loser you may or may not perceive yourself to be right now. The fact that you have the luxury of time to listen to this book and the money to buy it puts you way ahead of the game. This isn't something to feel guilty or whiny or superior about but it is something to appreciate, and should you make the decision to really go for it, know that you are extremely well poised to knock it out of the park and share your awesomeness with the world. Because that's really what this is all about. We need smart people with huge hearts and creative minds to manifest all the wealth, resources, and support they need to make their difference in the world. We need people to feel happy and fulfilled and loved so they don't take their shit out on themselves and other people and the planet and our animal friends. We need to be surrounded by people who radiate self-love and abundance, so we don't program future generations with gnarly beliefs like money is bad and I'm not good enough and I can't live the way I want to live. We need kick-ass people to be out of struggle and living large and on purpose so they can be an inspiration to others who want to rise up too. The first thing I'm going to ask you to do is to believe that we live in a world of limitless possibilities. I don't care if you have a lifetime of proof that you can't stop shoving food in your face or that people are intrinsically evil or that you couldn't keep a man if you were handcuffed to his ankles. Believe that anything is possible anyway. See what happens. What do you have to lose? If you try getting through this book and decide it's a bunch of crap, you can go back to your sucky life. But maybe if you put your disbelief aside, roll up your sleeves, take some risks, and totally go for it, you'll wake up one day and realize you're living the kind of life you used to be jealous of. Part 1. How You Got This Way Chapter 1. My Subconscious Made Me Do It You are a victim of the rules you live by. Jenny Holzer Artist, thinker, blurter of brilliance Many years ago, I was in a terrible bowling accident. My friends and I were at the tail end of a heated tiebreaker, and I was so focused on making a great show of my final shot, leaping into action, loudly declaring my impending victory, dancing and twirling my way through my approach, that I didn't realize where my feet were when I let go of the ball. This was the moment I was to learn how serious the bowling community is about penalizing those who roll with one toe over the line. They pour oil or wax or lube or something unimaginably slippery all over the alley, and should someone accidentally slide out of bounds while attempting the perfect hook shot, she will find her feet flying out from under her and her ass crashing down onto a surface that even an airborne bowling ball can't crack. A few weeks later, whilst lolling about in bed with this guy I met at Macy's, I explained that ever since my accident, I'm now woken up in the middle of the night with excruciating pain in my feet. According to my acupuncturist, this is from the nerves in my back getting slammed when I fell, and in order to sleep through the night, I need a new, firmer mattress. I have pains in my feet when I sleep too, he said, raising himself up for an unreciprocated high five. It's not just because I'm not into the whole high five thing that I left him hanging, but also because I was annoyed with him. 
I already find mattress shopping to be totally bizarre and embarrassing. Lying on your side with a pillow between your thighs for all to see like it's anyone's business. But the fact that I had to do it with my salesman lying next to me, begging for a high-fiver, was more than I could handle. I couldn't help but notice that all the other salesmen simply stood at the end of the bed, rattling off mattress facts while their clients tested out a myriad of positions, but not mine. He'd lower down next to me on his back, arms crossed over his chest, and thoughtfully chat away, staring at the ceiling like we were at summer camp. I mean, he was nice enough and incredibly knowledgeable about coils and latex and memory foam, but I was scared to roll over for fear he'd start spooning me. Was I too friendly? Should I not have asked him where he was from? Did he think I meant something else when I padded the empty space next to me to test the pillow top? I obviously should have asked Freak Show Bob to get off the damn bed, or found someone else to help me, instead of sneaking out the door and blowing my only opportunity that week to go mattress shopping, but I didn't want to embarrass him. I didn't want to embarrass him. This is pretty much how my family was trained to deal with any sort of potentially uncomfortable interaction. Along with the fail-safe method of running in the opposite direction, other tools in our confrontation toolbox also included freeze, talk about the weather, go blank, and burst into tears the moment you're out of earshot. Our lack of confrontation management skills was no great surprise considering the fact that my mother comes from a long lineage of wasps. Her parents were the type who believed that children were to be seen and not heard, and who looked upon any sort of emotional display with the same horrified disdain usually reserved for cheap scotch and non-Ivy League educations. And even though my mother went on to create a household for us that was as warm, loving, and laughter-filled as they come, it took years for me to finally learn how to form a sentence when presented with the blood-chilling phrase, we need to talk. All of this is to say that it's not your fault that you're fucked up. It's your fault if you stay fucked up, but the foundation of your fucked upness is something that's been passed down through generations of your family, like a coat of arms or a killer cornbread recipe, or in my case, equating confrontation with heart failure. When you came screaming onto this planet, you were truly a bundle of joy, a wide-eyed creature incapable of doing anything but being in the moment. You had no idea that you had a body, let alone that you should be ashamed of it. When you looked around, everything just was. There was nothing about your world that was scary or too expensive or so last year as far as you were concerned. If something came near your mouth, you stuck it in. If it came near your hand, you grabbed it. You were simply a human being. While you explored and expanded into your new world, you also received messages from the people around you about the way things are. From the moment you could take it in, they started filling you up with a lifetime's worth of beliefs, many of which have nothing to do with who you actually are or what is necessarily true. For example, the world is a dangerous place. You are too fat. Homosexuality is a curse. Size matters. Hair shouldn't grow there. Going to college is important. Being a musician or an artist isn't a real career, etc. The main source of this information was, of course, your parents, assisted by society at large. When they were raising you, your parents, in a genuine effort to protect and educate and love you with all their hearts, hopefully, passed on the beliefs they learned from their parents, who learned them from their parents, who learned them from their parents. Most people are living in an illusion based on someone else's beliefs. The trouble is, many of these beliefs have nothing to do with who they actually are or what is actually true. I realize I'm making it sound like we're all crazy, but that's because we kind of are. I breathe into it. I shut off the relentless yammering in my brain, get quiet, and surrender. I feel my body shift and go deeper into the pose than it's ever gone before. The pain is gone. The panic is gone. I am one with the universe. But then I realize that I really do think I'm stuck. And seriously, what the hell, dude? Are you going to talk all night? We've been in this freaking pose for five minutes for real. And by the way, my knee just got all hot. And you really are not going to shut up even though I keep thinking you finally are. But then you keep going and then whoosh. I reconnect. I'm back in the zone. I melt deeply into this pose and feel such bliss and true connection to something much larger than myself. This flip-flopping between freaking out in our heads and breathing into the now is basically how most of us go through life. Instead of worrying about the possibility of dislocating a hip, the future, or about how bad I was at this pose, the past, I could have luxuriated in the magnificence available to me in the moment. It never ceases to amaze me the precious time we spend chasing the squirrels around our brains, playing out our dramas, 
worrying about unwanted facial hair, seeking adoration, justifying our actions, complaining about slow internet connections, dissecting the lives of idiots, when we are sitting in the middle of a full-blown miracle that is happening right here, right now. We're on a planet that somehow knows how to rotate on its axis and follow a defined path while it hurtles through space. Our hearts beat. We can see. We have love, laughter, language, living rooms, computers, compassion, cars, fire, fingernails, flowers, music, medicine, mountains, muffins. We live in a limitless universe overflowing with miracles. The fact that we aren't stumbling around in an inconsolable state of sobbing awe is appalling. The universe must be like, what more do I have to do to wake these bitches up? Make water their most precious resource rain down from the sky? The universe loves us so much and wants us to partake in the miraculous so badly that sometimes she delivers little wake-up calls. Like in the movies, when someone narrowly escapes death and is so overjoyed and grateful that they take to the streets, skipping and laughing and madly hugging everyone in sight. Suddenly, all their quote-unquote problems fall away, and the miracle of being alive, today, in this moment, takes over the screen. I know someone who got sucked through a dam and almost died, who now speaks about it as one of his most profound and life-changing experiences. Not that I'd wish that on anyone, but take heart in the fact that should you require some sort of catastrophe for your transformation, it can be cosmically arranged. The universe has also surrounded us with the perfect teachers. Animals, for example. Animals are in the present all the time, and their secret power is to pull us in with them. My friend's dog is so happy to see her every single time she walks in the door, it's like she's about to free him from 40 years of imprisonment. Even if she's only been gone for an hour. You're here. I'm here. I love you. I'm going to pee all over the floor about it. Little kids are also excellent guides. Kids get so wrapped up in the joy of drawing or pretending or discovering that they'd rarely eat or bathe or sleep if we didn't make them. They're constantly creating in a state of free-flowing, concentrated bliss. They haven't yet learned to worry about what other people think of them or that perhaps they're not as talented at finger painting as Lucy next door is. They are in the moment. There is fun in the moment end of story. We would be wise to take more of our cues from the beasts and babies. All of the stuff we're so worried about creating and fixated on becoming is already right here, right now. The money you want already exists. The person you want to meet is already alive. The experience you want to have is available now. The idea for that brilliant song you want to write is here, now, waiting for you to download the information. The knowledge and insight and joy and connection and love are all wagging their hands in your face, trying to get your attention. The life you want is right here, right now. What the hell am I talking about? If it's all here, where is it? Think of it like electricity. Before the invention of the light bulb, most people weren't aware of electricity's existence. It was still here, exactly the same way it is right now, but we hadn't yet woken up to it. It took the invention of the light bulb to bring it to our attention we had to understand how to manifest it into our reality. It's not that the things and opportunities that we want in life don't yet exist. It's that we're not yet aware of their existence or the fact that we can really have them. The more practiced you become at being present and connected to source energy, the more available you are to download ideas and seize opportunities that you might miss out on if you're all wrapped up in the endless chatter in your head. There's a great Hindu story about a lady who wanted to meet the god Krishna. So she went into the forest, closed her eyes, and prayed and meditated on making the god appear. And lo and behold, Krishna came wandering down the forest path towards her. But when Krishna tapped the lady on the shoulder, she, without opening her eyes, told him to get lost because she was busy meditating on a very important goal. When we get so wrapped up in our heads, we miss out on what's available to us right now in the moment. Stop and notice how you feel right now. Feel your breath moving in and out of your body. Feel the air on your skin. Feel your heart beating, your eyes seeing, your ears hearing. Notice the energy inside and outside of you buzzing. Shut off your thoughts and feel your connection to source. Breathe. Even if you've got bone chilling credit card debts or you haven't spoken to your mother in six years, right now, in this moment, you can find peace and joy in that which simply is. As adults with responsibilities like bodies to care for and mortgages to pay, 
There's some value in taking a side trip away from the present moment every once in a while. Sometimes we need to think about and plan for the future, as well as study the past in order to learn from it, or laugh about it, or bury it out back and let it go forever. And if we just stop by for the occasional visits to the future in the past, that would be one thing. But the amount of time we spend chewing on junk food thoughts about what ifs and how comes, Lord help us. The more time you spend in the moment, the richer your life will be. Being present gets you out of your head and connects you to source energy, which raises your frequency, which attracts things of like frequency to you. And all of those high frequency things and experiences are already here, just waiting for you to join the party. All you have to do is shut up, show up, and usher them in. Chapter 4 The Big Snooze Wanting to be someone else is a waste of the person you are. Kurt Cobain You know who this one is, right? When I first started getting into self-helpery, there was lots of talk about something called the ego that confused the hell out of me. I always thought the ego was about being conceited and braggy and all... I'm going to talk on and on and on about how great I am, and then I'm going to show you my muscles. Meanwhile, even though arrogance and conceit, which are different from self-love and confidence, by the way, are part of the ego, they're not, as I later learned, the whole dealio. In the self-help slash spiritual community, ego is used to refer to the shadow self, or the false self, or the self that's acting like a weenie. It's the part of us that's driving the bus when we do things like sabotage our happiness by cheating on our husbands or wives because deep down we don't feel worthy of being loved, or that refuses to follow our hearts and pursue an acting career because we're terrified to be seen for who we really are, or that goes on and on and on and on about how great we are and shows off our muscles because we're insecure and need lots of outside validation that we're good enough. In other words, there's more than one way to go on an ego trip. From here on out, I'm going to refer to the ego as the big snooze, or BS for short. I think it'll be less confusing, plus I think it's more appropriate since the leading cause of sucking, i.e. staying broke, dating morons, uncontrollably crying in public because we hate our lives, is that we haven't yet woken up to how truly powerful we are or to how massively abundant our universe is. Alrighty, so moving forward. The big snooze operates according to your limiting false beliefs. This is the garbage that was stuffed into your subconscious as a kid that doesn't ring true for you, as well as the decisions you've made about yourself that are less than flattering or empowering. The big snooze gets its validation from outside sources, causing your inner dialogue to sound something like, I'm doing this to win your love, your opinion of me is more important than my opinion of me, the big snooze is reactive, my circumstances control my life. I am a victim. It's also fear-based and extremely committed to keeping you safely confined within the reality you've created based on these limiting false beliefs, otherwise known as your comfort zone. The big snooze lives in the past and in the future and believes you are separate from everything around you. Your true self or your higher self or your superhero self, your non-BS self, on the other hand, is the part of you that operates according to your connection to source energy. Your higher self gets validation from within, making your inner dialogue sound something along the lines of, I love and trust myself, this feels right to me, I have a purpose, I am loved. Until we wake up, which is what this book will hopefully help you do. Here's how it works. We as humans have a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. Most of us are only aware of our conscious minds, however, because that's where we process all of our information. It's where we figure things out, judge, obsess, analyze, criticize, worry that our ears are too big, decide once and for all to stop eating fried food, grasp that two plus two equals four, try to remember where the hell we left the car keys, etc. The conscious mind is like a relentless overachiever, incessantly spinning around from thought to thought, stopping only when we sleep, and then starting up again the second we open our eyes. Our conscious mind, otherwise known as our frontal lobe, doesn't fully develop until sometime around puberty. Our subconscious mind, on the other hand, is the non-analytical part of our brain that's fully developed the moment we arrive here on Earth. It's all about feelings and instincts and erupting into ear-piercing temper tantrums in the middle of supermarkets. It's also where we store all the early outside information we get. The subconscious mind believes everything because it has no filter. It doesn't know the difference between what's true and what's not true. If our parents tell us that nobody in our family knows how to make money, 
we believe them. If they show us that marriage means punching each other in the face, we believe them. We believe them when they tell us that some fat guy in a red suit is going to climb down the chimney and bring us presents. Why wouldn't we believe any of the other garbage they feed us? Our subconscious mind is like a little kid who doesn't know any better and, not coincidentally, receives most of its information when we're little kids and don't know any better because our frontal lobes, the conscious part of our brain, hasn't fully formed yet. We take in information via the words, smiles, frowns, heavy sighs, raised eyebrows, tears, laughter, etc. of the people surrounding us with zero ability to filter any of it. And it all gets lodged in our squishy little subconscious minds as the truth, otherwise known as our beliefs, where it lives undisturbed and unanalyzed until we're on the therapy couch decades later or checking ourselves into rehab again. I can pretty much guarantee that every time you tearfully ask yourself the question, what the fuck is my problem? The answer lies in some lame, limiting, and false subconscious belief that you've been dragging around without even realizing it. Which means that understanding this is majorly important. So let's review, shall we? Number one, our subconscious mind contains the blueprint for our lives. It's running the show based on the unfiltered information it gathered when we were kids, otherwise known as our beliefs. Number two, we are, for the most part, completely oblivious to the subconscious beliefs that run our lives. Number three, when our conscious minds finally develop and show up for work, no matter how big and smart and highfalutin they grow to be, they're still being controlled by the beliefs we're carrying around in our subconscious minds. Our conscious mind thinks it's in control, but it isn't. Our subconscious mind doesn't think about anything, but is in control. This is why so many of us stumble through life doing everything we know in our conscious minds to do, yet remain mystified by what's keeping us from creating the excellent lives we want. For example, let's say you were raised by a father who was constantly struggling financially, who walked around kicking the furniture and grumbling about how money doesn't grow on trees, and who neglected you because he was always off trying, and for the most part failing, to make a living. Your subconscious took this in at face value and might have developed beliefs such as, Money equals struggle. Money is unavailable. It's money's fault that I was abandoned by my father. Money sucks and causes pain. Cut to you who, as an adult, in your conscious mind, would love nothing more than to be raking in the dough, but who is subconsciously mistrusting of money, believes it's unavailable to you, and who worries that if you make it, you'll be abandoned by someone you love. You may then manifest these subconscious beliefs by staying broke no matter how hard you consciously try to make money, or by repeatedly making tons of money and then losing it in order to avoid being abandoned, or in a plethora of other frustrating ways. No matter what you say you want, if you've got an underlying subconscious belief that it's going to cause you pain or isn't available to you, you either A, won't let yourself have it, or B, you will let yourself have it, but you'll be real fucked up about it and then you'll go off and lose it anyway. We don't realize that by eating that fourth donut or by ignoring our intuition and marrying that guy who's an awful lot like our low-down cheating daddy, that we're being driven by our subconscious minds, not our conscious minds. And that when our subconscious beliefs are out of alignment with the things and experiences we want in our conscious minds and hearts, it creates confusing conflicts between what we're trying to create and what we're actually creating. It's like we're driving with one foot on the gas and one foot on the brake. Obviously, we all have awesome subconscious beliefs as well, but we're not talking about those right now. Here are some other scenarios that may or may not ring a bell. Conscious mind. I long to find and marry my soulmate. Subconscious mind. Intimacy leads to pain and suffering. Finger. Ringless. Conscious mind. I want to lose 25 pounds. Subconscious mind. People aren't safe. I must build a shield to protect myself. Body, a fortress of flab. Conscious mind, I'm hot and sexy and want to get it on. Subconscious mind, physical pleasure is shameful. Sex life, yawn. Conscious mind, I want to travel the world. Subconscious mind, fun equals irresponsible equals I won't be loved. Passport, blank. It's sort of like not being able to enjoy sitting on your front porch anymore because it totally reeks of something foul out there. You can come up with all these brilliant ways to deal with the problem. Light incense, set up fans, blame it on the dog. But until you realize that something has crawled under your house and died, 
your problems will linger on, stinking up your life. The first key to ridding yourself of limiting subconscious beliefs is to become aware of them. Because until you're aware of what's really going on, you'll keep working with your conscious mind, think you need to paint the porch, to solve a problem that's buried far beneath it, dead skunk removal, in your subconscious, which is an exercise in futility. Take a minute to look at some of the less than impressive areas of your life and think about the underlying beliefs that could have created them. Let's take the old crowd pleaser, lack of money, for example. Are you making far less money than you know you're capable of earning? Have you reached a certain income level that, no matter what you do, you can't seem to go above? Does generating an abundance of money consistently seem like something you're not even physically capable of? If so, write down the first five things that come to your mind when you think about money. Is your list full of hope and bravado or fear and loathing? What are your parents' beliefs about money? What are the beliefs of the other people you grew up around? What was their relationship with money like? Do you see any connection between their money beliefs and yours? Later on in this book, I'm going to give you tools to go much deeper with your subconscious beliefs and fix whatever's blocking you from living the kind of life you'd love to live. But for now, practice stepping aside, notice what's happening in the dysfunctional areas of your life, and strengthen your almighty awareness muscle. Start waking up to the stories you're working with in your subconscious, such as, I'll have to do things I hate in order to make money. I'll feel trapped if I get into an intimate relationship. If I go on a diet, I'll never get to eat anything fun again. If I enjoy sex, I'll burn in hell with the rest of the dirty sinners, etc. Because once you see what's really going on, you can start to drag out the stinky carcasses of your limiting subconscious beliefs and give them the heave-ho, thereby opening up the space to invite the fresh, new, awesome beliefs and experiences that you'd love to have into your life. Chapter 2. The G Word. If you want to find the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. Nikola Tesla, inventor, physicist, super genius. When I lived in Albuquerque, New Mexico, my friends and I used to hang out at this western bar called Midnight Rodeo. It was the kind of place that had curling irons and hairspray in the women's bathroom, Bud Light on permanent special for two bucks a can, and a solid oak dance floor the size of a cornfield. We were all from New York and were way too cool for country music. So at first we'd just go to snootily make fun of it all, taking great pride in being the first to spot a particularly gigantic belt buckle or a cowboy sporting one of them handlebar mustaches big enough to cover five upper lips. But our favorite part was the line dancing. We'd stare mesmerized by the giant choreographed mass of Garth Brooks fans stomping around in synchronized woo-hooery with their thumbs purposefully tucked into the front pockets of their jeans. It was so hilarious that we started joining in ourselves, waving from the middle of the sea of cowboy hats to our friends, Watch this! Then, you know, we'd stay on the dance floor for the next song just to try and get that part down where you click your heels right before the spin. Then we found ourselves sneaking off every weekend to merrily line dance our little achy breaky hearts out. Today he finds himself being his own boss, doing what he loves, traveling the world, negotiating multi-million dollar business deals, making a huge difference in his clients' lives, being creative, and setting an excellent example for his kids about living a life on purpose. A record producer I worked with decided to build her own recording studio. She put all her money and effort into buying all the recording equipment, instruments, amps, soundproofing, etc., only to have the entire thing burned to the ground almost immediately after it was completed. Instead of closing the shades, getting into bed, and sucking her thumb for the next two years, she raised the money she needed to rebuild an even better studio, and is now rocking so hard that she gets to handpick the musicians she works with and basically live out her fantasy life. So if you finally decide to quit your soul-crushing job and start the pastry shop of your dreams, be not upset if a truck drives through your front window into your scones. Instead of taking this as a sign that you shouldn't have opened your shop, take it to mean that you're ridding yourself of your BS and moving in the right direction. Growth ain't for weenies, but it's nowhere near as painful as living the life you're living right now if you're not really going for it. If you want to take control of your life and turn it into something as magnificently you as have the people I described before, stop at nothing. Have faith. Trust that your new life is already here and is far better than the old. Hang tight if the big snooze pitches a fit. Whatever happens, stay the course, because there's nothing cooler than watching your entire reality shift into one that is the perfect expression of you. Chapter 5 Self-perception is a zoo. I'm okay. I'm not okay. 
the title of my friend Cynthia's yet-to-be-written autobiography. I have a friend who's a professional speaker. She's the kind of person who is so articulate, so powerful and bright and naturally captivating, that she could be standing at the counter ordering a burrito and I'd get all teary-eyed. That's right! No refried beans! You heard the woman! So imagine my surprise when, after one of her talks, she plunked herself down next to me and demanded to know how boring it was. I also have gorgeous friends who think they're hideous looking, brilliant clients who one moment think they're God's gift to mankind and the next need to be talked off the ledge of self-proclaimed ineptitude, and an entrepreneurial neighbor who can't decide if she's a financial powerhouse or if she's about to cause her family to start living underneath a bridge. Self-perception is a zoo. We spend our lives drifting between glimpses of our own infinite glory and the fear that not only are we totally incapable, unworthy, lazy, and horrible, but that it's only a matter of time before someone blows the whistle on us. We torture ourselves incessantly, and for what purpose? If we can glimpse the glory, and I know you can, why do we waste our precious time giving any energy to the other options? Wouldn't life be so much more fun, productive, and sexy if we fully embraced our magnificently delightful selves? It's just as easy to believe we're awesome as it is to believe we're giant sucking things. It takes the same amount of energy, the same amount of focus. So why do we choose all the drama? Have you ever noticed how when someone you admire goes out and does something phenomenal, you're happy for her or him, but you're not surprised? Of course they did something phenomenal. They're a phenomenal person. But to get yourself to see how amazing you are is like pushing a giant marshmallow up a hill. Yes, there we go. We are up. We are awesome. Oop, we're sagging. We are sagging on the left. Push it up. There we go. We're all good. Wait, now we're sagging on the right. We run around, taking one step forward and 14 steps back, when it's so unnecessary. Instead, try seeing yourself through the eyes of someone who admires you. They get it. They believe in you leaps and bounds. They aren't connected to your insecurities and negative beliefs about yourself. All they see is your true glory and potential. Become one of your own diehard fans, look at yourself from the outside, where all your self-doubts can't crawl all over you, and behold what shines through. You get to choose how you perceive your reality. So why, when it comes to perceiving yourself, would you choose to see anything other than a super huge rock star of a creature? You are a badass. You were one when you came screaming onto this planet, and you are one now. The universe wouldn't have bothered with you otherwise. You can't screw up so majorly that your badassery disappears. It is who you are. It's who you always will be. It's not up for negotiation. You are loved, massively, ferociously, unconditionally. The universe is totally freaking out about how awesome you are. It's got you wrapped in a warm gorilla hug of adoration. It wants to give you everything you desire. It wants you to be happy. It wants you to see what it sees in you. You are perfect. To think anything less is as pointless as a river thinking that it's got too many curves or that it moves too slowly or that its rapids are too rapid. Says who? You're on a journey with no defined beginning, middle, or end. There are no wrong twists and turns. There is just being. And your job is to be as you as you can be. This is why you're here. To shy away from who you truly are would leave the world you -less. You are the only you there is, and you are the only you that ever will be. I repeat, you are the only you there is, and you are the only you that ever will be. Do not deny the world its one and only chance to bask in your brilliance. We are all perfect in our own magnificent fucked up ways. Laugh at yourself, love yourself and others. Rejoice in the cosmic ridiculousness. Part two, how to embrace your inner badass. Chapter six, love the one you is. If we really love ourselves, everything in our life works. Louise Hay, author, publisher, the godmother of self-help who was doing it way back when it still wasn't cool. I was hanging out at my brother Bobby's house one day, lying on the couch, watching his then two-year-old son waddle around. At one point, someone knocked something off the coffee table, and my little nephew bent down to pick it up. Bobby turned to me and said, Did you see that? The guy knows exactly how it's done. He bends at the knees, keeps his back straight, 
hip squid, stomach tight, flawless. Thrilled to have such a willing and skilled exhibit A, Bobby then proceeded to spend the next couple of minutes dropping more things on the floor. A spoon, a TV remote, an empty can of beer, and my nephew, in perfect form, continued to pick it all up as my brother kept up a running commentary on his posture, muscle usage, seriousness of manner, and the fact that my nephew was pulling it all off with great dignity even though his diaper was sagging. It's incredible. The kid could flip over a car without straining his back. I can barely pull up my pants without having to be rushed to the hospital. When we're born, we have an instinctual understanding of some of the most important basics of life that includes and goes way beyond bending in our knees instead of our lower backs to pick a beer can up off the floor. We're born knowing how to trust our instincts, how to breathe deeply, how to eat only when we're hungry, how to not care about what anyone else thinks of our singing voices, dance moves, or hairdos. We know how to play, create, and love without holding back. Then, as we grow and learn from the people around us, we replace many of these primal understandings with negative false beliefs, fear, shame, and self-doubt.